Uh, Mr. President, thank you so much for taking your time and talking exclusively to the public broadcasters across the whole Europe and the whole world at this extraordinary time. My name is Angelina Kraikina, and I'm from the Ukrainian Public Broadcaster. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us, to the world's public broadcasters, at this incredibly difficult time. Mr. President, thank you very much. Uh, first question, how are you? And can you tell us more about your personal life in this building? I know it's not about you, that's what you're going to say, but... We'd like to know, do you sleep well? Do you have time for yourself? Do you see your family? Do you have time to read? First, how am I? I feel fine. I believe that I'm not sick, and I am a perfectly healthy man. I understand exactly what is happening. I make accurate decisions calmly. I think it's important for us to be very balanced now. Our military is showing its strength. It is also necessary to show balance, to remain strong fighters, to defend the state. At the same time, to show attitude even to the enemy, to show human attitude. It is very important for me that people see that we are defending our state, but I repeat, with a human face, that we do not torture people. We are showing that we are ready to defend, and not ready, so to speak, to win at any cost, because this is not a game. And so, we are highlighting the difference between the people who came to invade our state, who came to our land. It is very important for us to show that our people are fighting in a civilized way. That is very important. I'm more focused, because a lot of things depend on me. I want to give only the positive not in the sense of smiling, but positive in terms of my actions. And I do not want to harm any of our citizens. People are important because you see that the people themselves are defending our state. This means that they are our most important and possibly only treasure and protection. This is our Iron Dome. This is our security union. This is our people. Regarding what I read now, I don't read fiction right now, to be honest. I love it, but I understand that I can't. I read the first page, but then by the second, I'm already thinking about what's happening here. So I read the second page again, because I didn't take in what I had read there. Then I move on to the third and forget again. Because the head, the brain, are clogged up with other processes, other decisions, it's difficult to relax. Mr. President, uh, Ukraine is going through a very hard time, but also it seems united as never. Uh, do you think that uh, this historical change is taking place not only in Ukraine, but in, in the whole world, maybe, maybe in Europe? Uh, and what, what is to be at the center of this historical change? The world will change. It has already changed. Politicians are already afraid of their people. They are afraid of social responsibility. They see that people are reacting differently. And in many countries, people support us 100%, but their leaders do not support us 100%, for one reason or another. I'm not saying here who is right, but it means that social and public opinion will be stronger than any leader in the world. That is to say, we are all seeing changes in processes, changes that lead not just to theoretical but to popular democracy. 
Popular democracy is not a revolution. Democracy is first and foremost power of the people. If you want to be the leader of your society, you have to be the leader of society, not to command, but to be a leader and live with them in the same spirit. Therefore, it seems to me that this popular democracy is taking place in the world and that this will lead to certain security alliances. I am confident that there will be new security alliances in the future. This does not mean that it's necessary to leave any union. It does not mean that it is necessary to destroy things that work. No, it does not mean that. People just want peace, tranquility, stability, and most importantly, confidence. Here, in all these challenges, confidence, be it the new COVID or, God forbid, war. A person who lives, pays taxes, who resides here, was born or came here, is a citizen of the world for peace. And this person must know that they must be protected in this country. And if this person leaves for another country, the person will be protected there. The person will not suffer. The world is facing just such a challenge. It will either accept this model and come to such alliances, or there'll be a change of many world leaders, and their societies will find proper people for themselves. Mr. President, I have a question regarding these alliances. Have you thought about not joining NATO, considering the war and all external threats that are incoming? In the Constitution, we have our intentions with NATO. There is ambiguity from NATO in relation to our acceptance in the alliance. There is clarity from some countries, which see us belonging there, and only with them. At a minimum, at least one-third of all countries do not see us there. Some of them will not say publicly that they'll accept us there. Most of them are afraid to talk about it publicly. That is why we need to revert to the previous question. They think that society will pressure them. Therefore, I think we need to divide this up into several approaches for this mighty challenge. In general, we need to find a format in which we have an understanding of whether Russia wants to stop the war. Otherwise, we may not get to all the rest. In principle, it concerns whether Russia wants it or whether Russia is even able to do it. If we understand that Russia is able to do it, or will face problems due to sanctions, internal pressure, conflicts within its borders, empty shelves at shops, or change of political elite, which are caused by the war against us. And we understand that all these things we have launched with our Western partners together, then we will have taken the first step towards the union needed in the world. By being united, we can stop any aggressor. In this moment, that is why I believe in my meeting with the President of the Russian Federation, in any format. I repeat it again, and I have repeated it and proposed it for several years. I know only one thing. 
Our future will not forgive us for the loss of our population. Our state will not forgive us for the loss of our people. Our future generations will not forgive us for the loss of our territories. They will ask us, what were we fighting for? I want to know exactly where we are, who are our friends, and who doubts us. I'm not saying we have enemies in the West. No. There are people who are ready for anything on our behalf. But there are those who are not ready. That is all. Therefore, it is important when we talk about certain compromises. I said when I became the president that we cannot give up any part of our land because we must do everything for Donbas and Crimea to return. This is not a platitude. All our people believe and think so. The question now is when can we stop this war? There is no need for Russia to shout harsh rhetoric. We have an ultimatum. It will not lead to anything. We have an ultimatum. Here are the points. You will fulfill them, and then we will end the war. This is incorrect. It'll lead nowhere. The question doesn't concern only me. This question concerns the fact that the people and government are united. We're not all going to be able to do that. You can't do that with ultimatums. Ultimatums will not be fulfilled by Ukraine. We just cannot comply with it physically. We've lost people, our people. How can we do it? All of us would be destroyed. Then their ultimatum will be automatically fulfilled. For example, give us Kharkiv. Yes, for example, give us Mariupol. Give us Kyiv. Neither Kharkiv nor Mariupol nor Kyiv residents nor the president will be able to do this. And we even see it in the occupied cities, in Melitopol, in Verdyansk. When they enter, people will notify each other. They raise the flag and people take it down. They killed a man, so people hid and came at night and removed the flag. Well, what do you want? To destroy everyone? That is why I said we will fulfill an ultimatum only when we do not exist. You can automatically capture this city but you will live there by yourself. You will work there by yourself. People will either leave the city or those who cannot leave will fight to the end. Therefore, an ultimatum is a bad thing because it will lead to genocide and the destruction of the Ukrainian people. We are so energized now. Therefore, it comes down to dialogue. We are for peace. I repeat it again. Even no matter how difficult it is, it is better than war, and even though we hate these troops that are out there, the right word is negotiation. Negotiate however you can. But negotiate. Do not execute ultimatums. This is an important point. A compromise can be found in dialogue. For me, any compromises are relevant. Because, as you know, this hatred will be for every word, for every demand, for every course, for every guarantor of security, for everyone. You understand, right? Time must pass. Therefore, if they want to end the war, they must agree on a ceasefire withdraw troops, then presidents meet, agree that troops are withdrawn and that there are certain security guarantors. Here you can find compromise. There are certain guarantors of our security. They must say tomorrow that they are accepting Ukraine into NATO and not being unclear anymore, or say, we're not accepting it now. That is true. And they themselves understand that they do not want to go with Russia, so they do not accept us. 
всі вже розуміємо. Нас не беруть, тому що бояться Росії. Ось і все. The answer is very simple. We already understand everything. We're not accepted because they are afraid of Russia. That's all. And we need to calm down and say that. Say, okay, we need other security guarantees. There are NATO member states that want to be the guarantors of our security, which unfortunately can't provide us full membership in the alliance, but are ready to do everything that the alliance would have to do if we were members of the alliance. And I think that's a normal compromise. It's a compromise for everyone, for the West, which does not know what to do with us in the NATO issue, for Ukraine, which wants security guarantees, and for Russia, which does not want to let NATO expand further, and says that it has had such agreements with NATO countries, with the West. And so, a compromise must be found in this, because this will be the end of the war. For Russia, this is not the end. There is this public letter, I don't know by whom, I don't remember by the Minister of Foreign Affairs or by the President of Russia. Stop talking to us with phrases like denazification, etc. We immediately said that this sounds like an ultimatum, and we do not tolerate this, because as soon as we're accused of Nazism by people who follow in the footsteps of Nazism, then we will not be able to tolerate it. Therefore, public rhetoric can be anything. It's the business of every state in this world. But this will not be binding rhetoric. Mr. President, a clarification. Where are Crimea and Donbass in this? They will come later. That's why I'm talking about approaches. I'll finish now. I think this is a very difficult narrative for everyone both Crimea and Donbass. It will be hard to digest for everyone. And to find a way out, we need to take this first step, which is, as I've said, security guarantees, the end of the war. At the same time, we should also agree that we are resolving the issue of temporarily occupied territories. We have to resolve it, but after the end of the war. Why? Because everything is very hot, as I've said. Very hot. And so, this blockade will end. And after this blockade, please, let's talk. At the first meeting with the President of Russia, I am ready to raise these issues. They are relevant. For us, the occupied territories are important. But I'm sure that this decision will not arise in this meeting. Because there is, how do you say, if we're completely frank, we will have to talk about constitutional changes, changes in Ukrainian legislation when it comes to security guarantees. And if we talk about it, it will in any case be decided not only by the president, but, as it is quite a long process, by both the parliament and the people of Ukraine. And when I say the people of Ukraine, in these negotiations with the Russian Federation, we will still arrive to these negotiations as we've explained. I did not meet with Russian negotiators, but with our negotiating groups there. I explained to them, Look, when you talk about certain changes, which might be historic, we will not avoid those. We will put them to referendums. The people will have to say and respond to some of the compromise formats you mentioned. But what they'll be is a matter of our conversation and understanding between Ukraine and Russia. How many war videos do you speak to every day? Every day, ten, about eight, ten. Wait, who is your preferred? Preferred? Preferred maybe you shouldn't go back. I don't know. I, don't, I have, I, I can tell you with whom I have uh, very many, too many connections. Not too many, no. I mean. Who, who in Europe? <laughs> no, not who too many, <laughs> uh, to be understandable, <laughs> rightly. <laughs> uh, I have many, a lot of connections with uh, with uh, Dudam, Andrzej Dudam. Mm -hmm. 
I have many connections with uh, Macron. I have uh, connections, many connections, with Boris Johnson. Uh -huh. uh, with our, I think, Baltic, Baltic countries. Okay, so all are your preferred? Like children. I Whom I prefer? Mm -hmm. With my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you... Sorry. Я хотіла би попросити вас сказати, що I would like to ask what you would say to Ukrainians when they see Russian troops through their windows in their villages, towns. Also, in your interview to CNN, you mentioned that if negotiations with Putin fail, then there's a risk of World War III. What did you mean by that? What I meant is that Putin doesn't have plans to end this war, as Ukraine is only a path he is going down which is to continue on to Europe. First of all, taking Baltic states, countries that were part of the USSR, and then other countries that had Soviet armies and were under Soviet influence. I have been saying this to our partners, including Mr. Schultz, that they might end up with Russian troops at their borders. But then we can certainly see that it would be World War III. If our negotiations fail, then we can confidently say that it's not by accident that he's asking for demands that will be rejected by Ukraine. He's setting demands which we cannot agree to before saying they simply didn't want peace. And then Russia will go full force towards the borders of European or NATO countries. It would be World War III. Um, if you if you were going to meet with Mr. Putin in ten minutes, in ten? Yeah, why not? Uh, in Kiev. In Kiev. Uh, what what <laughs> would you do? What would you tell him? What will be your first sentence? Я буду намагатися пройти все, що бентежить, і чим не I will try to cover everything perplexing, and say everything that Ukrainian people think in detail. And if I had the opportunity, we would cover every topic. Will we resolve them all? No. But partially. Most important of which is to stop the war and let them understand that by destroying us, he will only destroy himself. I don't want us to be known in history as a nation that doesn't exist. As a president, I don't want this destiny for our country and people. Mr. President, this is this is the biggest uh, refugee crisis in the, uh, in Europe since the Second World War. Uh, Ten million people left their homes inside Ukraine. Three and a half million people are abroad. What would be your message to to those people who who are abroad and to to people and countries who took them in? Everybody needs to become Ukrainian, at least temporarily to feel in their own skin, to know that it's a war and that you can lose everything, your life and everything that matters to you, to feel that pain, not just be concerned, 
When you are feeling, you will do what you can to stop this. Because people, no matter who they are and what they do, they still think about themselves first, about their life. So what they can do for their own life is to be Ukrainians. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm